there's a long history. <laughs> we know what happens when you have rent controls. You, you have uh, no construct, new, no new construction and no maintenance of the existing uh, 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 housing stock and you have a deteriorating housing stock and yet city governments and continue to implement that policy. It's such a shame that what is good economics is often not good politics. <laughs>
And Dempsey's observation was that, look, um, as long as there's an incentive to, to, to make sure that the team is working efficiently, the residual claimant will put certain practices in place to help facilitate that job. So for example, um, stock options, which are widely criticized, particularly by people like Elizabeth Warren as being giveaways to managers. Well, stock options play the very valuable role of tying the performance of the organization to the compensation of the manager, which gives the manager an incentive to, to make that team an efficient team. Um, and uh, if we do away with stock options or, or other types of compensation that are performance-based, well, that means that the shareholders have to do a lot more monitoring of managers. Um, uh, and, and they may, may be, A, they may not be capable if it's a particularly complex type of organization, and B, they may not have the time or the inclination. So what's going to happen is people won't invest. They'll invest uh, uh, in other things besides companies <laughs> because they can't make those, they, they can't be assured that the companies are going to operate efficiently. So, so the UCLA school has a lot to say about contemporary issues of how managers are rewarded, what managers should be expected to do, and in fact, how organizations should exist um, uh, because the organizational structure itself will be shaped to promote team production. Uh, if give, we'll just give one example. Um, uh, accounting firms um, are, are, and consulting firms are very often organized as partnerships or limited corporations. That is, they limit the number of shareholders. Why do they do that? Because, because monitoring the activity of those types of organizations requires some knowledge of what those organizations do. Um, not every shareholder would know, well, what is a legal firm supposed to do and when is a lawyer operating efficiently or not, but a partner in the firm observing the behavior of other people in the firm has a much better idea of who's shirking, who isn't, who should be rewarded more, who should be rewarded less. So th the main point is that the governance of organizations respond to incentives and shareholders have incentives to, to promote efficient teamwork. So while you were answering that made me think of um are there any circumstances in which shirking might be efficient um because you have to invest in trying to eliminate and and you know identify when it's happening and and you know there, those are costly activities um are there situations where firms are like let them shirk well, the short answer is I agree with you, although I'd qualify that by saying that the concept of shirking kind of implicitly has the connotation that the, the you're leaving something on the table, that, that if that individual were not shirking, more output would be produced. But, but let's just any type of behavior uh, which on the surface looks inefficient might well be efficient once you take into account transactions costs and information costs. And, and, and an example would be inventories. I mean, why, why do companies uh, and landlords in particular, for example, um, have, have um, inventory or vacancy, apartment vacancies? That looks inefficient. You should have full usage of every resource all the time. Well, that's not possible in a world where there's transactions costs and information costs. Um, um, so, you know, in the case we talk about in the book of empty apartments, why would a landlord not just rent an apartment for any price they can get in the marketplace and not leave it vacant for more than five minutes? Well, because that would put a, an enormous burden on potential renters to be active in the market every minute of the day because the price is constantly changing and people, that would be a significant transactions cost. So empty apartments are basically an inventory to give people time to search. And, and it makes search less costly and the reduction in search costs is greater than the loss in having 
some vacant resource lying around. Yeah, when I was asking that question, I was very much thinking about myself and my summer job that I used to have as an undergrad. Uh, I worked at a landscape supply place and all I did was really read books because it rains a lot in Pennsylvania where I'm from. And so I shirked, but my employer didn't seem to, to care too much about it at all. Um, so. Well, it may also be that um shirking in in the sense that i'm using the term which is you are not being as efficient as you could be even considering all of the costs of trying to be efficient um, shirking may be part of your compensation and if you weren't shirking you might get a higher salary uh and so the employer mm -hmm. might make a trade-off and say okay i'll let this person shirk for a while uh, but but the compensation the monetary compensation is going to reflect that it was certainly not very much money. <laughs> um, are there any reasons to believe that firms are artificially larger than what might be efficient? So I know a lot of um, criticisms from people who are kind of free market types might say, you know, the government has granted, you know, corporations legal personhood. There's a lot of involvement in the state with legitimizing certain forms of business structure. Um, what problems might that cause? Well, it, it, certainly the, the uh, UCLA uh, 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 authors of studies of regulation and, and of in, antitrust, and that, that includes Demsitz and Peltzman and Hilton, would say um, the real danger to competition is a regulatory monopoly, essentially. Uh, that uh, and, and what that would, of course, involve, it typically involves, is consumers paying more than they should, quote unquote, for the output, but then the regulator redistributing, essentially, the captured profits uh, to, as cross subsidies. Um, we talked about that earlier in the, in, 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 in the day. Um, and, and what Demsys would say is that, look, um, there's no guarantee that a private market, unregulated market, would not, would not result in a single firm or a very small number of firms emerging as the sole producer or producers. Uh, should we worry about that? Well, Yes, we don't want companies to exploit consumers, but what, what Demsets would say is, look, if, if, if any company in the private sector is making what economists call economic rent, which are profits above and beyond what's needed to keep the company in business, then you have an incentive for other firms to enter and compete away those rents. And what, what Demsets believes he he found and Peltzman supported him with some empirical work is that large firms tend to be more efficient in settings where you have particularly large firms and uh, it, it's not primarily a function their profits that is it's not primarily a function of their market power that is their their dominance in the marketplace it's a function of their efficiency and if they stop being efficient new firms will enter and take market share away from them. So the protection against monopoly abuse is an open market and the potential for entry. Yeah, you have a, a nice section in the book um, titled, Does High Market Share of a Few Companies in Imply Market Power? And so um, in your response just now, you touched on some of the things that get brought up in that chapter. Um, and so, you know, lack of competition or, or having very, very large firms, that's supposed to be you know, from, from, you know, mainstream economic theory, that's supposed to be a no brainer where we need to get the government involved in kind of reducing that market share. Um, but as you said, it's not always just about the market share, it's about the efficiency. Are, is there a kind of a pattern to the type of markets where large firms tend to be more efficient? Yes, I think, I think there, there, there's certainly a pattern where you have large fixed costs uh, and relatively low marginal costs. 
firms that operate efficiently are going to be pretty far out along their cost curve and therefore pretty far down the demand curve. That is, they're, if they're efficient and they're setting prices competitively, they're going to wind up with a large market share because they can supply a large part of the market at a relatively low price and be acceptably profitable. So, you know, industries like the petroleum refining refining industry and and now network uh, uh, businesses like um, Meta, formerly Facebook, and uh, and Alphabet, formerly Google, are, are examples of companies where there are obviously large, what economists call economies of scale, meaning being large can provide you with opportunities to be low cost, but you have to take advantage of them. You have to, you have to implement uh, what we were all, er, earlier talking about efficient team production uh, in order to leverage those economies of scale. In that same section of the book, you mention a few other practices that seem anti-competitive on the surface, but UCLA scholars highlighted that they're really not so anti-competitive after all. Um, so you mentioned things like territorial restrictions or um, you know, advertising, those types of uh, management of resale prices. Can you talk a little bit about some of the things that we think about as being not competitive um, and, and why we might be mistaken about some of those things? Yes, and I would say as a, as a preliminary that, that the antitrust law in the U.S. and the Competition Act in Canada identify certain practices as not, not per se illegal, but as creating a presumption that large businesses might be acting in ways that are not in the interest of consumers. And territorial restrictions are one example. So what's a territorial restriction? Well, for example, Caterpillar in Canada, Caterpillar, the, 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 they make heavy earth moving equipment that are used for mining operations, for large construction sites, et cetera. Um, in Canada, Caterpillar had a practice of essentially uh, designating a single company as having the franchise to sell and service Caterpillar equipment in that province. Well, on the surface, that looks anti-competitive. Uh, you have only one supplier and servicer of Caterpillar equipment in Alberta. Uh, why don't we have more? And the consumer presumably will be better off by being able to shop at different uh sellers. Well, what the UCLA school uh, suggests is that you need to recognize the reality of markets, including things like transactions costs and information costs. An earth moving machine costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. And anyone who buys that machine wants to use it efficiently. They don't want it lying around because they can't get a part to repair the machine. They also want to know that if they're going to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars for a machine, it's going to do what this, the, the supplier says it's going to do. Well, let's imagine a situation where you had multiple sellers of earth moving equipment in Alberta. Well, one of those sellers might have an incentive to say, OK, I'll sell this machine to this customer, but I have no intention of servicing it. In fact, I have really no great interest in in ensuring that the machine does exactly what the customer wants it to do. Because if it doesn't work out, well, Caterpillar is the one that's going to get the, it's the brand name of Caterpillar that's going to be hurt. My, I'll be hurt, for sure I'll be hurt, but my hurt is a small share of the total hurt that occurs. If you have one seller, that seller is going to lose an enormous valuable franchise if they do not perform the way Caterpillar, the manufacturer, wants them to perform. So Caterpillar is effectively saying, look, we're giving you a very profitable franchise that we'll take away if you don't 
maintain the brand name the way we expect you to and and in structuring the arrangement that way they create an incentive for the seller to maintain the brand name and that's also what the UCLA school said about advertising but for years economists would argue about well is advertising wasteful or not and and the debate came down to well what exactly is the ad that I'm looking at does it tell me objective facts about the product or does it give me some aspirational uh, feel-good messages you know, you'll be popular <laughs> with when you use our product um, what the UCLA school said is that that's all beside the point the real purpose of advertising is to create a brand name and to demonstrate to the marketplace that you've got a strong commitment to keep that brand name because if you've spent tens of millions of dollars advertising a product and you don't produce a product that makes consumers happy, you're out of business and you've lost tens, hundreds of millions of dollars. So advertising is really a sunk cost investment to signal to the marketplace that your product is, is going to be a satisfactory product at the price. Now, if, if information were costless and there were no no issues of interpreting information that that wouldn't be done i mean why would you do it you just have to show your product to the consumer <laughs> give them a test run and that's the end of it they'll like it or they won't by the way that's 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 a, a, an interesting uh case which is not discussed in the book but which certainly is a corollary is when the government or let's put it this way, when the government allows for restricted advertising, uh, that could hurt the consumer. I'm thinking of things like the dental associations and the medical associations who say to their members, no, you can't say that you're better than the other dentist down the street or the other physician. Now, that'll confuse consumers and it'll degrade the, the um, well, it'll degrade the profession. Well, <laughs> what it really does is it prevents people from committing to good quality. So interesting. I thought you were going to talk about um, in the U.S. when they restricted the ability for cigarette companies to advertise at all. That was something that the cigarette companies wanted because then it acted as kind of a barrier no other company could then get their brand out there to other people. That's right. um, so some, in, in a sense, maybe limiting people's ability to advertise is the true anti-competitive practice. Yes, in many cases, indeed. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about um, regulation and the unintended consequences of regulation. Um, I know this is something that we touch on later in our policy conversation, but I want to understand a little bit about, um, you know, Peltzman and some of the really interesting examples that um, he, he goes into, like the, with the FDA and, and some seatbelt examples. The, I think these are really, really fascinating. Um, and so I would love to hear you talk a little bit about Sam Peltzman's work and those particular examples. Yeah, so um, Sam Peltzman was, uh, he, he, one of his very famous articles was an evaluation of 1962 uh, legislation in the U.S., which um, required drug companies to prove not just safety, but efficacy uh, in the use of the drug that they were trying to sell, uh, bring to market. And what Sam uh, discussed was that, look, this is another cost and another barrier to bringing new drugs to the marketplace. And uh, maybe the, the, uh, the FDA thinks it's doing everyone a, a service by, uh, uh, by discouraging inefficient drugs from being produced and marketed. That's a waste of resources, obviously, if it really is inefficient. But what Sam said is, look, uh, by, by creating this additional barrier to bringing 
drugs to market. You may prevent efficacious drugs from coming to market. And, and, and he showed that, in fact, in that trade-off, the FDA discouraged a, a large number of new drugs from coming to market that only a small percentage, in, in retrospect, might have been considered inef ineffective. Uh, and that, that therefore uh, patients on balance were made significantly worse off by that particular regulation. Uh, he also then, in another famous article, talked about um, all of the regulations uh, re related to uh, safety features in automobiles, seat belts and, uh, and the like. And uh, what he said was, look, um, in theory, the, the uh, the, the rationale for these regulations is it's going to save lives because if people get into accidents, well, they'll be better protected against serious injury or, or in, the in extreme death. And what Sam said is that there's an unintended consequence. Uh, the unintended consequence is people drive faster and they drive with less care. Uh, and as a result, uh, there's incidental damage done to uh, pedestrians and motorcyclists, and on balance, it's not clear that the total, uh, let's call it, uh, uh, quality of life years saved uh, with these safety features is positive. It may well be negative, and that was a very controversial uh, 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 discussion that Sam had. That's very you know, counterintuitive, and it, it's very reminiscent of Adam Smith's man of systems issue where we have this social problem that we want to solve and we think we can manipulate the incentives just in the right way to get the result that we want but people respond to rule changes in ways that are sometimes unpredictable um and in so case, yeah. yeah i you know there's many examples that we could think of i know um, the childproof pill bottles was another example in the U.S. that we wanted to have, you know, childproof pill lids to prevent children from having accidental ingestion of, of drugs. But the population of people who uses the most medications are, are elderly people who do not have an easy time opening those bottles. Right? Exactly. And so you get the lids left off completely. That's a great example. Yeah. I was going to add that in some cases, the unintended consequence is totally predictable. And yet the regulator goes ahead with the with the regulation. I mean, rent control is a great example where uh, there's a long history. <laughs> we know what happens when you have rent controls. You, you have uh, no construct, new, no new construction and no maintenance of the existing uh, 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 housing stock. And you have a deteriorating housing stock. And yet city governments and continue to implement that policy. It's such a shame that what is good economics is often not good politics. <laughs> it's such a shame. Um, so I want to think a little bit about um, some of the more intentional outcomes of the regular pro regulatory process. So um, you had just mentioned that some of the con unintended consequences are predictable, but regulators go ahead and, and pass the rule anyway. Um, but in the book, you talk a bit about something called what we call regulatory capture um, and how there are intentional outcomes of the regular regulatory process that might be inconsistent with what is best for society. Um, so, so what are the goals of the regulator? Well, um, as we were talking about earlier, the, the, the one feature of regulation, it's a ubiquitous feature of regulation is cross subsidies. Mm -hmm. Some people's income is transferred to other people. And to do that, you need to protect the marketplace that's providing the subsidy because otherwise the subsidy will be competed away. The source of the subsidy will be competed away. So in Canada, uh, we, we still have a significant cross subsidy that goes from um, urban centers, that is subscribers in dense urban centers such as Toronto, to rural subscribers. That's an intentional cross subsidy. Uh, it, it, it's not an unintended outcome. Uh, 
but to do that, the regulator needs to ensure that the, the, the phone companies uh, earn enough money so that they can cross subsidize from their lucrative markets to their less lucrative markets. Um, and, and so we have in Canada uh, restrictions on foreign competition. The, the, uh, the government, the Canadian government, uh, has a process uh, in place where if a foreign telephone company wants to enter the Canadian market, they're restricted in terms of how much of the market they can, they can uh, take, 10%. Uh, well, that's part of the way that the regulator, in this case, the government acting through the regulator, the CRTC, is going to ensure that those cross subsidies can continue. Uh, because if, if, regulation, if, if entry were not restricted, where would companies like Verizon or AT&T go in Canada? They'd go to Toronto. They, they'd offer wireless service in Toronto and Vancouver and Calgary and the dense urban centers. And, and then the price would come down and there goes your source of cross subsidy to the rural subscriber. You have a few other kind of interesting examples in the book that I would love for our listeners to hear a little bit about. You talk about um, public transportation and and streetcars. Um, can, can you, just kind of run through that kind of example for us. Yeah, well, that was that was a, an example that was in uh, George Hilton's article, famous article about jitneys. And uh, basically, in the early 1900s, municipalities, uh, he was talking about the US in this case, municipalities uh, basically uh, uh, gave franchises, monopoly franchises to um, surface rail companies to, to run from point to point, to carry passengers from point to point within cities. And um, the, um, of course, that was not as efficient as one would like, because if you didn't live near the main line, uh, literally the main line, rail line, well, then you would have to do a lot of walking or bicycling or somehow get yourself from the, the station that you were entering or, or leaving from to your house or your business. And so um, that created an incentive for private automobile operators to act as uh, essentially as common carriers, that is to uh, go out and uh, and pick people up who wanted a ride from point A to point B B that wasn't on the main line, and 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 in fact it was extremely <laughs> an extremely successful form of competition, so successful that the main line surface rail companies complained to the municipal authorities that this was going to drive them out of business because their pricing structure, not only their route structure but their pricing structure was not satisfying market demand. They gave, they they charged. A single, it was it started out at 10 cents, that's a long time ago. Uh, 10 cents, no matter how far you rode on the train. Well, people who were only going a short distance weren't too happy about subsidizing people who were going the long distance. And so the jitneys offered differential pricing based on distance and even time of day. If you use their service during the peak hours, you'd pay more. And if you use their service in the off peak less, whereas the, the surface rail company just prices 10 cents, regardless of when you get on. Uh, and so uh, the jitneys were driven out of business by the regulators and, and the monopoly franchise was maintained. But of course, technological change made that surface rail less efficient than say buses because at least buses can turn corners and they don't have to go along a single route uh, they they can they can go along uh, a number of routes but here we have uber and lyft uh, ride hailing companies which are basically the contemporary jitneys saying that look uh, we can do this more efficiently for a lot of consumers uh, and of course you have now what amount to the, the taxi cab drivers, not surface rail companies, saying to regulators, this is unfair competition. Uh, these people aren't doing X, Y, and Z that we do, uh, and therefore you shouldn't allow them in business. So Hilton's conclusion is, look, allow entry, but don't favor certain participants in the market and disfavor others. I mean, if, 
if the jitneys are going to use the roads and they're going to cause road damage, they should be charged for the road damage that they cause. Um, um, but preventing entry really almost always amounts to only delaying entry and often encouraging entry, which is less efficient than some other form of entry that you might have had. For example, jitneys were more efficient than buses, but the regulator allowed buses to replace the streetcars because, again, um, that was uh, uh, creating cross subsidies that the regulator wanted to have in place. One of the thoughts that you leave us with in that particular section on regulation is that just because we can identify that there's a market failure or a social problem, it does not imply that government regulation is necessary or that it would even uh, result in an improved outcome. And so I think that goes back to the Nirvana approach that uh, the, U the UCLA school empl employs. Um, I thought that that was a really fascinating end thought. Um, but it seems like when people spot social problems or market failures, they push for regulations. What, what might you encourage people to look at instead? Or, or, or how, how would you encourage people to kind of temper that urge or to not buy into that nirvana fallacy so much? Well, I, 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 I guess it, 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 the most, uh, possibly the most effective uh, uh, remediation would be to follow the money. I think, I think people, when, when they read about a proposed regulation, might ask themselves the question, who really is going to benefit from this? Uh, is it really going to do what the regulator claims it's going to do, which is typically some kind of social purpose. Uh, for example, a lot of cultural regulation in Canada is built around the idea that national identity depends on having quote unquote Canadian culture. Well, what is actually being produced? Does it seem to contribute to a stronger national identity or does it seem to create subsidies for certain participants in the economy, such as n local newspapers or writers and directors of, of Canadian uh, films uh, uh, and books. So I think trying to understand who really benefits from this is one step that might, 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 might help. So what are some criticisms of the UCLA approach? I know one of the criticisms you mentioned in the book is that the UCLA school is a, a staunch defender of free markets and they're a bit ideological, um, but that's not exactly a fair assessment. Um, are there other common criticisms that get uh, levied at this approach? Yeah, I, I think another criticism, which is really a methodological criticism, is that um, <laughs> the analysis is too simplistic. It's not it's not heavy duty mathematics and econometrics. Uh, that is, mathematical and statistical tools were not. They really weren't the um, the the main uh, instrument that the UCL economists used. They they would use statistics, of course, but but it was mainly logical thinking from some reasonable assumptions and, and, and using empirical evidence uh, that modern day economists and even economists at the time, would some economists were saying, well, this really isn't state of the art analytical work and therefore why should I trust it? It's just too simplistic. And, uh, I, I can assure the listeners that people like Alshin and Sam Peltzman uh, were very mathematical. I can remember the first class I had with Armin Alshin. It was a graduate course in microeconomics, and he didn't even introduce himself. He just started writing Lagrange uh, equations and using calculus to differentiate. And we were all looking at each other. We thought this was an economics course, not a math course. But they didn't think that that was the way to analyze 
real world problems most effectively, that, that they didn't need all of that apparatus. I think that's fascinating. Um, there definitely is a attitude in the economics profession that uh, math and formal modeling is equivalent to a rigorous analysis. Um, and I do agree that the scholars that are part of the UCLA school definitely show that that's not the case. They're not always, they're not, uh, one in the same. You can be very rigorous without having a paper that is full of equations. Well, uh, Steve, before we go, I would love to hear if you have any kind of last thoughts that you'd like to leave us with, with regards to the UCLA school. Yeah, I think I think what I would like to leave the listener with is the is the uh, the insight that that the insights that the UCLA economists had are very durable. I mean, there's there's almost nothing I can think of in retrospect that I would say, well, this is clearly not right uh, about what uh, uh, what they said. And 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 policy, while it's always changing still reflects a lot of the insights of the UCLA school. So um, I think that's a real legacy uh, of the economists there. That it is an enduring legacy that we can continue to use this framework to understand modern problems. And in part three of our conversation, David will be joining us and the three of us will talk about some of these modern problems that we can use the UCLA school to understand. Thank you so much for your time today, Steve. I've had a lovely time talking with you. Thank you. You've been listening to Essential Scholars, a new podcast series that explores the ideas and insights of some of history's most influential thinkers. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please be sure to subscribe and head over to EssentialScholars.org to learn more. See you next time.